Shall we say amen? Thank you, Brother Art. Thank you, Pastor Rodriguez. Praise God for preaching us and sharing us. Amen. About our purpose. Amen. I want you to know my purpose. Because until purpose is discovered, your life has no meaning. Because purpose is the source of your fulfillment. Amen. Praise God. Your potential, our potential, enables us, praise God, to fulfill our purpose. And your purpose reveals the potential hidden with you. Come on. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. I, I can see in this place. Amen. Feel a pregnant other God given potential. Amen. Evangelists, pastors, ministers. Praise God. I believe we can reach the world. I believe that God will use us. Amen. To reach the ends of the world. We just need to know and connect it to our source. And thank God that we are connected to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. And His name is Jesus Christ. We just need to be connected to Him. Amen. I can't wait to hear the next speaker this morning. Amen. Discovering our leadership. I believe we have here. We, we, we have potential to lead. Shall we say amen? And I'm not sure about being a boss, but I know that we have potential to lead somebody to know God. Amen. This time, allow me to present to you, to bring to you, amen. Pastor Art Hodges, pastor of beautiful driving church in San Diego, California. Amen. Let's welcome him this morning. Amen. And before I forget, praise God, we have notes. Uh, pastor Hodges prepared notes for you, but this is, we prioritize the pastor. So pastors, if you would, Come to the center because we have a very limited supply of these notes and we want you to be the first one. So if you're interested, move to the center, please. All the pastors and ministers, you would want to have a copy of this. Amen. Shall we clap our hands again? Praise the name of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Brother Hodges, please. God is great, and He's greatly to be praised. Thank God for purpose. Thank God for potential. Revelation chapter 4 and verse 11 says, all of us begin with this purpose. Revelation 4.11 says, for all things are created for God's pleasure. And for God's pleasure are they created. So if we are the creation of God, we were created for His pleasure. If we are seeking our own pleasure in life, we are doomed to be disappointed. But if we will seek the pleasure of God in every area of our life, we will find success. Amen. Praise God. Thank God for purpose. Thank God for potential. I want to say first of all, thank you for the invitation from Brother Ben Pats in particular, and also all the brethren who are working with him to put on Tukon, and also the entire general board here in the Philippine Islands who are uh, supporting and endorsing this effort, and also all the sponsors, all of our fellow pastors from the United States and from Canada who are helping sponsor this uh, Tukon and who are here. Thank you for the invitation. And it's so good to be with our friend, my namesake, Pastor Art Martinez. He's Pastor Art Philippines. I'm Pastor Art United States. 
and our good uh, assistant district superintendent for the Vegas, and also uh, all of you wonderful brethren and sisters. Many of you we know, and many of you we don't know, but uh, after this weekend, we will all know one another, and we are blessed because of the great family. Good to see Brother Roger back there, a couple of us. I just saw you, Brother Roger. Praise God. Amen. From our church in South Bay. It's also uh, a delight always, and I want to acknowledge Brother Ed Obando, who helps oversee our Philippine ministries in San Diego. And Brother Ed does all of the, I call him my Filipino John the Baptist. He's the forerunner. Whenever we come to the Philippines, he comes ahead, and he, he prepares the way. And he does a good job preparing the way. He's a tremendous man, tremendous minister, great leader. And I'm so delighted this year to have with me the second time to be here with us to the Philippines, my associate pastor for the last 21 years, for the George Knobs. Does such a tremendous job leading in our church and in our area. Praise God. Amen. Brother Knobs is the premier associate pastor, I think, in all the United Pentecostal Church. And uh, our wives are with us on this trip, but they're not here today. They are still jet lagging in the hotel room. But uh, you will see them before this is over. Amen. It's a delight to be here and to be a part of this great meeting. I love the work of God. I'm blessed to be part of His kingdom. And uh, I'm not worthy. I'll tell you up front, I'm not worthy of the calling and callings that God's placed in my life. And most of them are not of my own choosing, but I accept them and I will endeavor to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith He has called me. Though I'm not worthy, I will try my best to walk worthy of the vocation. That's all any one of us can do, I think, is to do our best to walk worthy of the vocation. Praise God. I have been asked to speak to you on the topic of leadership. And so I'm bringing you today, uh, if we were in college, we might call this Leadership 101. I'm bringing to you today an introductory lesson to the topic of leadership. I have many, many, many different lessons I could um, choose from, and but this is an introductory lesson, and to be honest, I'm not for sure exactly which one I'm bringing tomorrow. I just thought I would be here today and, and get a feel for for this meeting and kind of try to tailor our lesson tomorrow to meet what I, I feel in the spirit. But today's uh, topic uh, for this 2005 Tugon in Manila, Philippines, United Pentecostal Church International, is entitled Leadership, What Is It? Leadership, What Is It? The scripture says in Matthew chapter 20 and verse 25, but Jesus called them unto him and said, You know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. Today we are talking about spiritual leadership. When I use the phrase spiritual leadership, this alone qualifies the meaning. We recognize that leadership is exercised in a vast number of ways. There are, for example, leaders in crime. There are leaders in business. We are having this conference on a military base, and as we pulled in, we saw they're preparing for some type of uh, ceremony, probably some type of promotion or graduation uh, ceremony on the on the uh, stadium field. And there is certainly leadership in the military. There are leaders in government. There are leaders in politics. There are leaders in many various civic and community affairs. And there are also leaders in the spiritual world, both angelic leaders and demonic leaders in the spiritual world. But God Himself has leadership in the church. And thank God for the church. We're part of the church. Hallelujah. Praise God. 
God has leadership in the church. But the leadership of the church of God is many times and in many ways very different from the leadership exercised in the rest of the world. And so it's not just spiritual leadership, but think for a moment in terms of Christian leadership. Because it is possible for leadership to be spiritual, yet bad at the same time. As we pointed out, the entire spiritual world, and the world of evil influences, definitely has its hierarchy of leadership. But Christian leadership, by absolute definition, has to be leadership by Christ. He is the head, amen, of the body. Or leadership by one who is Christ's disciple. Therefore, the subject we are dealing with today must deal with the principles of leadership which Jesus demonstrated and taught. However, we'll also deal with the psychology of leadership in the natural sense. We are three-part beings. We are spiritual beings. We are emotional beings, and we are also physical beings. So we'll bring a little bit of the physical world into this in the natural sense, though sometimes just as comparison. So back to the question of our topic, our subject title today, leadership. What is it? Sometimes we discover best what things are by first of all identifying what they are not. In the arena of leadership, I think this is certainly true, because there are so many models in the world today of leadership that are not Christian leadership. They are not biblical leadership. They are not godly leadership. We're not in a business meeting today. We're at a church conference. We're talking about leadership in the kingdom of God, in the church of God, according to the description of the Bible. Praise God. Amen. So I want to first of all remind you of what leadership is not. Leadership is not position. Leadership is not title. Leadership is not an office. Now these are things that the world many times believes leadership is. I've heard people before say, if only I could attain this title. Some are working to get a title in front of their name. Others are working to get a title behind their name. Some are not satisfied with the titles they already have. So they are looking to add more titles in front of or behind their name. But leadership is not a title. Leadership is not an office. Remember there was a time in our local church that we had a need to fill a vacancy in a leadership position. And I had one good brother, well-meaning, and he came to me and he said, Pastor, he said, I hope that you will consider me for that particular office. He said, if you will give me that position, you will be amazed at what I can do for God. And I said, my brother, you are a very good man. And you are very sincere and you're very honest. And the statement you just made is exactly correct. Because if it takes me giving you an office or a title or a position to see what you can do for God, then truly that's amazing. Because we should be doing for God without an office, a title, or a position. If God has filled you with His Spirit, if you are born again, if you have been experienced or what we call salvation, it is not just so you can make heaven your home. It is so now you can live for Christ. To die is your reward, but to live is Christ. So every Holy Ghost filled believer is called to do the work of the ministry unto the Lord, to the body of Christ, and evangelizing the world with this gospel. Don't wait for the title. Don't wait for the position. Don't wait for the office, praise God. If you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, you've been called, you've been chosen, you've been selected. Praise God. I taught a lesson, I think it was last year, to our usher and hosts and greeter team at our church. And I called it leading from the back. I talked about how these are the people that are always in the back of the church. Rarely are they on the platform. Hardly ever are they standing in the pulpit or at the podium. They're always at the back and they're doing their best job, but they're invisible. 
The work's getting done, but people don't even realize they're doing it. And so many times it goes without thanks. Or even thought, many times. But I told them, make no mistake about it. There's a God in heaven and a recording angel who's a secretary up there, and he writes down every deed done for the kingdom of God. Even the one that brings a cup of cold water, amen, does not go without a reward. Praise the Lord. And so I told them, I am leading from the front, but you are leading from the back. And I need you just like you need me, praise God. God has called us both to lead just different places of leadership. Praise the Lord. So leadership, what is it? Leadership is not position. Leadership is not title. Leadership is not having an office. Leadership can be defined in one word, and this one word is key to the whole subject and certainly our, our lesson today. Leadership is influence. Turn to your neighbor and tell them that. Leadership is influence. Influence is the key. James C. Georges from the Power Group said this. What is leadership? Remove for a moment the moral issues behind it. And there is only one definition. Leadership is the ability to obtain followers. B.E. E. Ho said, It occurs to me that perhaps the best test of whether one is a qualified leader is to find out whether anyone is following him. I had a leader come to me at one time in the local church. And he said, Pastor, he said, I need you to call a special meeting and meet with everyone in the particular group that he was supposed to be leading. And I said, what's the problem? He said, I need you to tell them I am their leader. And I said, well, why? Don't they know? He said, apparently not because none of them will do a thing that I tell. Well, he didn't realize it at the time, but what he was doing was tendering his resignation. Because from his own lips, he was admitting he was not the leader of the group. We had given him the title. He had the position. He filled the office. But he was no longer the leader. Because no one, by his own admission, was following him. The old Chinese proverb says, he who thinks he is leading, but has no one following, is only taking a walk. At least this guy was getting a little exercise, but, you know, the Bible says bodily exercise profits just a little. So, it's, it's not leadership. Michael Shea, Scottish author and broadcaster, said this. Persuade the decision makers that the decision you want is their idea. Leaders, that's your key. That's your secret. Influence is persuading the decision maker. Who's the decision maker? Everybody you lead is the decision maker. Amen. They're making decisions daily. Multiple times. Your job is to persuade them that the decision that they want to make is their idea. Leadership. Let's talk about two contrasts. To contrasting philosophy and leadership. There is the position-oriented leader versus the influence-oriented leader. Don't judge anyone else with this topic, but judge yourself. See if you can find yourself in the list. The position-oriented leader drives his followers. But in reading the scripture, I never find where the Lord calls us to be cattle drivers. Shepherds. And the influence leader, the shepherds, will lead their followers. The position leader depends upon authority. He says, you will do this because I'm the leader. But the influence leader depends on goodwill. The Bible says that we are to lead people. And they, it's a, it's a, dependent upon the, the will. It's a willing Willing type of leadership and a willing type of followership. The scripture says not to exercise lordship right. over God's kingdom and God's people. Praise God. So there has to be a willingness there. The position oriented leader instills fear. Whereas the influence leader inspires enthusiasm. 
person who's following the influence leader is not following them because they're afraid not to. That's not to say there's not a healthy respect and a fear of God, certainly. But the reason they're making the daily decision to follow that leadership is because they are enthusiastic about it. They're excited about it. They want to. They desire it. Praise God. The position oriented the leader says, I. It's all about the big me. The influence leader says, we. We realize that it's a team. We're a body. Praise God. None of us are the head. Jesus is the head. We're all members of his body. Praise God. The position leader fixes the blame for problems. I remember one time we were at a church camp where we camp out outdoors and, and in the middle of the night, it was very late at night, and my family had brought a a puppy dog to the camp out, a new new dog in our family. And, but he was a very strong puppy dog. He was a basset hound. They're very, very strong. And we tied his rope to a a post that was in the ground near our campsite. It also, though, was the support post for the the water, the water faucet that came up out of the ground. And as the kids would run by, the puppy dog would try to follow the kids, and he would run and he would catch the end of his his rope, his leash, and it would jerk him back. And, and uh, one time he was all the way over here at the end of his rope, and, and the kids ran that way, and he ran after them full speed, and when he hit the end of it, it snapped the support stick in the ground, and the pipe, which I think was plastic, it broke it. And that water was under pressure, and it started shooting way in the air. And I'm not sure anybody realized it immediately. We were in a different part of the campground. It was night, it was dark. But next to our campsite, there were some people who were sleeping in a couple of tents on the ground. And the campsite sloped in their direction. And it wasn't but just a few moments and that water began running into their tent. And it woke them up. And needless to say, they became very loud and they got our attention. There was a problem. We tried everything to uh, to stop it. I think Brother Ed, I think, was even there. I think Brother Ed maybe had the idea to drive a stick into it or something. We, we, we tried everything, but nothing would work. And then we're looking for the person that runs the camp and trying to get someone. We couldn't find the water shut off. And finally we found the fella. He came in his little cart. And, and, uh, and here the water is going everywhere. And he was more interested in finding out whose fault it was that this broke than he wasn't fixing the problem. He kept saying, who did this? Who did this? And we said, well, a puppy dog broke. But I want to know who did. And I said, look, blame me, but, but let's talk about that later. Right now, just fix the problem. We have water that's flooding the campsites. I could tell right away why he was working the midnight shift. He's not a leader. <laughs> a leader is going to fix the problem. Later on, we'll worry about fixing blame. But right now, just fix the problem. Praise God. Amen. Position leadership versus influence leadership. A position leader knows how it's done. In fact, it's been my experience that position-oriented leaders usually think they know everything. And they seem to have the attitude that hardly anybody else knows anything. But influence leaders, they realize they don't know everything. They don't know much of anything. But what they what they know is there's something to be done and we've got to put forth our hands to do it. And, and so the influence leader just shows the way, just gets it done. They may have never done it before, but they just get it done. I love what Scripture talks about when it talks about wisdom and wise people. I don't have the reference in hand, but there's an Old Testament Scripture and it says, He that would be wise is he that sees the work that needs to be done and puts forth his hand to do it. There are too many people waiting on their education. Too many are waiting on resources. Too many are waiting on things outside what they have already to get things done. But look at how the Lord picked leaders every time He picked people who felt inadequate. Moses said, I don't have a thing. And the Lord said, what's in your hand? He said, that's just my old staff. And the Lord said, I'll use it. Praise God. 
Quit waiting for the resources to get the job done. Just make yourself available. Amen. The Lord will give you the resources. Here am I, Lord. Use me. Praise God. Put forth your hand to do it. The position leader says, go. Like King David, when kings were at war, he was at home. The influence leader says, let's go. He's leading the charge. Praise God. So leadership is influence. Now, it's very true that you can impress people from a distance. But you can only influence and impact them up close. Influence is a close-up thing. You see, at a conference like this, it's very easy to impress people. We can bring equipment and set it up and, and we can have technology and fancy things and handouts and, and people can say, well, that's really impressive. He's really a great guy. You see, my true test of success and leadership is not what you think about me when this conference is over. My true test of leadership is what my wife thinks about me what my children think about me. That's the true test of leadership. I've seen leaders forfeit family in order to attain public success. My friend, they've got it all backwards. I'm telling you here today, it starts with family. And it ends with family. That's the starting point, and that's the finish line. Oh, praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. Again, don't wait for the title, the position, the office to practice leadership. Start practicing it at home. Praise God. Spiritual leadership begins at home. First Timothy 3, 2, a bishop, then must be blameless, the husband of one wife. Spiritual leadership begins in your marriage. One that ruled well his own house, having his children in subjection with all gravity. I looked up the word rule. I'm using the King James here in this particular rendering. The original definition of this word rule, rule of means to stand before. Kind of a different definition from, from ruling in the sense that we would most commonly think. Someone that's taking authority over. And we know there's an order of the home. We know that the husband's the head of the home. But in this particular rendering, it's saying the way that you rule the home is to stand before the home. It's in the sense of being an example. Someone who's standing before you is, is the model. It's the example. It's saying husbands, fathers, you be the model for your home. You be the example for your home. There's nothing that will cause us to lose our families from serving the Lord any quicker than for us to preach one thing in the pulpit and then see continually something different at home. We taught a lesson to our leadership here some time back. The title of the lesson was, Don't Practice What You Preach. We've heard that most of our lives, haven't we? Practice what you preach. My leadership lesson was entitled, Don't Practice What You Preach. Rather, preach what you practice. There are too many that are preaching it, trying to live up to what they're preaching. And they're failing. You're under condemnation and shame. You need to, first of all, practice it. And once you've mastered it in your life, then you can go out preaching it. Praise God. The, NS, the NRSV, the NIV, the NASV, and many other translations, in place of the word rule in this passage, uses the word manage. It would read this way, one that manages well his own house. And then verse 5 says, For if a man know not how to, again if you use the other translations, manage his own house, how shall he take care of the church of God? Listen, leaders, it starts and it ends at home. Because anyone can teach what they know. 
But everyone is going to reproduce what they are. One of the greatest rewards I've received in my whole life is when a teacher came to me and, and uh, gave me something in confidence, one of my children's teachers. And they said, every year I do an exercise. I have the students in my class write a, a paper on the subject, my hero and why. And they said, in all the years that I've done this, I've never had until now someone write about their parent. And I was so taken with that, I wanted you to see a copy of that. And here's, here's what I received from them. My dad is someone I consider successful. Five traits. Number one, a stable walk with God. Number two, a positive attitude. Number three, he is faithful in his tithes and offerings. It's interesting what our children observe, isn't it? Hello? Number four, he is fulfilling God's will for his life. Number five, he puts others before himself. That was the summation. And then the paper said this, My dad is someone that I consider to be successful. He has a stable walk with God and he is willing to serve him no matter what. My father is fulfilling God's will for his life, that is taking on the responsibility of pastoring God's flock. He has a positive attitude about life. He always tries not to let a negative word come out of his mouth. I've always known my dad to be a cheerful giver. He gives whatever God lays on his heart, knowing that God will provide the need. My dad has learned the lesson of putting others before himself, which is the lesson of humility. I want to be a success just like my dad. And my friends, you can't buy that at the Hallmark store. You can't. You can't even buy that with increased allowances to your children either. You're going to buy that with daily living. And that's more valuable to me than having my picture in a magazine and some kind of award. This is the most valuable. Because leadership starts at home and it ends at home. Praise God. Praise God. We don't consider Noah to be a failure, do we? We consider him to be a man of God and a successful one. Though he preached for over a hundred years and the only converts he had when he was all finished was his family. But thank God for eight souls of Noah's family that were saved by water. Praise God. Thank God. Hallelujah. My friend, it begins and it ends with family. Number two, leadership number one is influence. Number two, leadership is both something you are and something you do. It's both something you are and something you do. In Proverbs 23 and 7, Whereas a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We are a summation of our thoughts and desires. Emerson said, what lies behind you and what lies before you pales when compared to what lies within you. Edwin Markin said, we are blind until we see that in the human plan, nothing is worth the making if it does not make the man. Why build these cities glorious if man unbuilded goes? In vain we build the world until the builder also grows. Jack Parr said, looking back, my life seems to be one long obstacle course with me as the chief obstacle. In reality, though, he meant that as a joke. That is the truth. The truth is, our greatest enemy it's not without, it's within. The truth is, our greatest enemy is not our brother. It's the guy looking back at me in the mirror every morning. The truth is, I am my own worst enemy. Paul said, I must die daily. He said, I crucify, not others. He said, I crucify my own flesh. Praise God. Hallelujah. To live is Christ. To die is gain. Zig Ziglar. He said, you got to be before you can do. And you got to do before you can have. Human nature says, I want it now. 
I want it before I pay for it. And I want it before I've earned it or before I've matured enough to handle it. I want it now. But the truth is, if you'll do the things you ought to do, not that you want to do, if you'll do the things you ought to do, when you ought to do them, the day will come. You can do the things you want to do when you want to do them. But it starts with being. Ralph Waldo Emerson said, you cannot travel without until we first travel within. This leadership thing starts within. Because God ultimately will reveal in public what you are in private. Listen, David faced three major Almost supernatural, that is beyond the ordinary battles in his life. Two of them, the first two, note, note this, they were the first two, were in private. The third was in public. The third we're most familiar with, and all Israel was most familiar with, because it's when he faced down the divine giant Goliath. But before he ever went to that battlefield, that public arena, and faced down the giant that would result in Saul's being sung about him, such as Saul had slain his thousands, but David is ten thousands. Before he could handle that type of accolade, he first of all had to pass the test and win his private battles. His private battle was one day when a bear came, and another day when a lion came. No one was there. It was just David, his father's sheep, and God. But David felt a sense of responsibility not only to his father, but to God. And he was willing to lay his life down for one lamb. In human reasoning, that makes no sense at all. If he had asked his father, his father would have said, David, don't jeopardize your life. Why, give him a lamb. I can have many more lambs, but I only have one baby. David had the heart of a shepherd. He had a heart that later was described as being a heart after God. A man after God's own heart, praise God. And he was willing, like true shepherds, to lay his life down for the sheep. And why did David face those tests? Because in order to successfully conquer in the public arena without it eventually destroying you, you've got to first of all win your private battles. And I propose to you, brothers and sisters, every one of us are facing not only public battles, but we're facing private battles. And truth be known, the private battles are more important than the public ones. We've all got a lion. We've all got a bear. We've got to deal with it privately. The Bible says there are three aspects to our temptation. There's the lust of the eye. All these are in the world. The lust of the eye, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. Every battle you face is going to fall into one of three categories. Money, power, or sex. Two of those, this is my own observation, two of those are going to be your private battle. And one of those is going to be your public battle. But I challenge you today, I admonish you today, win that private battle at all costs. Praise God. Win that battle at all costs. Whatever I've seen, we don't like to talk about this, but every now and then, unfortunately, there's a man of God who falls in a tremendous public failure and disgrace. And there's no more disgrace for a man of God than, than the moral area. And when this happens, it's a tragedy and it hurts all of us. It hurts the church of God and the kingdom of God. And I've looked for a common, common thread. And I think I found one. But, but uh, without going into that right now, suffice it to say that in each of these instances... They never conquered the private battle. You've got to win the private battle. The common thread between these that fall is that they're not under submission to spiritual authority in their own life. They may be men or women of authority, but they're no longer men or women under authority. And my friend, when you step out from under spiritual authority, you set yourself up for failure. You become vulnerable to temptations Christ never even wanted you to encounter or face. But you make yourself vulnerable to that. Win the private battles. Vince Lombardi said, The way you win shows much of your character, but the way you lose shows all of your character. Do you know we can learn just as much from failure as we can from success? In fact, truth be known, probably most of the time we learn more from failure than we do from success. 
Many times we succeed and, and uh, someone asks, so how did you do it? And really, we don't have the answer. Yes. That happens in church growth. Well, well, how did you grow the church? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I can't tell you what the key element is. But every one of us, every one of us can readily identify why we failed. Praise God. And so we learn from those mistakes. It reveals our character. John Maxwell said, everything rises and falls on leadership. The church is not going to grow beyond its leadership. Praise God. And so the building begins with me. God, grow me. Because the church rises and the church falls on leadership. Praise God. Rick Warren said, if you want to know the temperature of your organization, put a thermometer in the leader's mouth. You want a worshiping church leader? Be a worshiper. You want an evangelistic church leader? Be evangelistic. Praise God. You get what you preach. And you need to be preaching what you are. Hallelujah. Amen. I was asked one time, we were at a meeting at headquarters of one of our very top officials. I was in his car riding to the restaurant to meet with this group. And he said, Brother Hodge, I want to ask you a question. At that time, I was serving as the church growth coordinator and served for a number of several years. He said, I want to ask you a question with all of your travels and all of your studies and, and everything. He said, what's the number one key to church growth? And you know, I didn't have to hesitate at all. It just, it just came right out. I said, that's easy. I said, the number one key to church growth is the attitude of the leader. Attitude. Is the number one thing. The attitude of the leader. Our attitudes are contagious. Our attitudes are contagious. People catch them just like they catch colds or the flu. By getting close. And as the leader gets close to those he's leading, they catch attitudes from him. The president of Hyatt Hotel said... If there is anything I have learned in my 27 years in the service industry, it is this. 99% of all employees want to do a good job. How they perform is simply a reflection of the one for whom they work. Leaders, be careful before you criticize those who are following you. Because many times, they are simply a reflection of the one they are following. The Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. He knew he was saved if he kept following Christ. Amen. Praise God. Bruce Larson wrote in his book called Wind and Fire some interesting facts about Sandhill Cranes. He said, these large birds who fly great distances across continents have three remarkable qualities. He said, number one, they rotate leadership. No one bird stays out in front all the time. They rotate leadership. Number two, they choose leaders who can handle turbulence. Turbulence means rough times. Rough times. Storms, tests, problems, criticism. They handle turbulence. And third, all during the time one bird is leading, the rest are honking their affirmation. Glory. 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 Now we heard it just a minute ago, 1 Corinthians 11, 14, doth not even nature itself teach you. We learn a valuable lesson here, leaders, concerning spiritual leadership. After all, God created the birds. Amen. He said they rotate leadership so they don't burn out. Fresh. Fresh ideas. Fresh vision. Praise God. Amen. Hallelujah. He said they can handle turbulence. Turbulence. They can, they can fly above the criticisms and the problems and the difficulties. 
and all of that. I had a neighbor who lived across the street from me for seven years. And and he came back into our life and we've been interacting with him. And, and he, he said to me, he said, my wife and I have observed you and your family very closely for seven years. And he said, we came to the conclusion that your family is not normal. Because you are always happy. He said, now at first we thought it's because you were just lucky. We just met the luckiest people in the world. Everything goes right. Nothing ever goes wrong. But then he said, we saw some bad things happen to you. And you were still happy. Your house flooded. And I came over to see the flood, but also to see how you would react. I said, now he will be normal. But he said, do you know what you did? I said, I didn't even remember my house being flooded. He said, oh yes. And as you laughed, I went home and told my wife, it's true, they are not normal. They are not normal. He said, but we have decided we also would like to not be normal. We want what your family has. Godly leaders learn how to handle turbulence. Paul said, I count my afflictions in this life glorious. Praise God. It's an opportunity to reap heavenly reward. He called his trials just small things in life. When you read the life of Paul, I don't know that anybody in this arena today has had trials any greater than the Apostle Paul. But he called them small things. And he rejoiced in those trials. Amen. For the glory of God. Thank you, Lord. Amen. And the third lesson we learn from nature is that whoever is leading, the rest of us are to be giving accolades and verbal affirmation. Praise God. Amen. Amen. I tell our worship leaders, you need to respond in the pew like you want people to respond when you're leading worship. Hallelujah. Amen. As preachers, we need to respond to other preachers as we want to be responded. you sow. You do reap what you sow. If you become very critical of leadership, guess what? Those you are leading are going to become very critical of your leadership. We are going to reap what we sow. The Bible says, blessed are the merciful for that they shall obtain mercy. We're going to reap it. Learn a lesson from nature. Praise God. Brother Knobs, my associate pastor and I, in this quest for leadership and church growth, we attended, and I attended in particular, many different conferences and meetings. I've read many books, and I continue to do that. But in the midst of this quest, we were, we were at a particular conference one time. We paid a lot of money for it. I think we paid around $1,000 to attend this conference together. It was probably three days long, something like that. And, and uh, we, I think it was the first day. We had an exercise, it took most of the day, and the exercise was, we want you to write a description of a happy, successful member of your congregation. And so we wrote, we filled one or two or three pages, we wrote this description. Then the lecturer came back and said, now I want you to take that and put it down to one paragraph. We thought, that's very difficult. We worked and we got it down to one paragraph. And then he came back and we were kind of hoping at that point he would call for someone to read. We wanted to read ours. We were very proud of it. But he didn't ask for anyone to read. He, he said, I want you to take that paragraph and I want you to put it into just one sentence. And we thought, this guy's too hard. I don't know that this could be done. But we worked at it and worked at it and we worked at it and we got it down to, to one sentence. And then... We were sure he was going to call for some responses, but he didn't. He said, now I want you to put it into one word. And now we thought, this guy's crazy. That is impossible. But we all started working, very frustrated at first. We finally came up with one word. I call it my thousand dollar word because it cost about a thousand dollars to 
go to this meeting and time and effort. But the more we thought about that word, and this is several years, a few years ago now, several years ago, and it's still just very validating today even. And, and from that, God gave me a revelation. It was some time later after that conference. And, and it was almost like God spoke audibly to me. I had spent much time and effort and money going to meetings and just trying to absorb everything I could. And God spoke, and here's what He said. He said, I have not called you to grow a church. That really startled me and kind of made me step back because that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to grow a church. I was reading every book I could read. I was going to every seminar and conference I could go to. I was talking to everyone I could talk to. I was trying to grow a church. And, and it was like God was kind of slapping me here right in the chest. And he said, stop. I haven't called you to grow a church. He said, I've called you to grow people. And if you will grow people, they will grow a church. That one word that we came up with to describe a happy, successful member of our local church congregation was this word, growing. 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 It doesn't matter if they are a brand new believer or if they have been born again for 10 or 20 or 30 years. The truth of the matter is how long they serve the Lord does not determine their level of happiness or success. It's whether or not they are growing as a new believer or as an old believer. Are you still growing? I can apply that to leadership. What is a successful leader? What is a happy leader? Who are the leaders that sense a fulfillment in their life? It's those who are growing. I find myself, when I quit growing, I begin to experience dissatisfaction. I begin to experience apathy. I begin to experience dis disappointments and discouragements even and frustrations. And I'm pointing at all the things surrounding me. I'm pointing at circumstances and pressures and other people. But the reality of God's Word, which is a mirror to me, is that I'm the one. I'm the one. As long as I'm growing, I'm happy. Praise God. I'm successful if I'm growing. So I challenge you as leaders, change your focus. Your focus is to now grow people. In every aspect of their life, as a result of your leadership, they are better people. As a result of your leadership, they're better husbands, they're better wives, they're better parents, they're better children, they're better friends, praise God. They're better workers at the job. They're better neighbors in their community. Amen. They're better in every way because of your leadership in their life. Leadership is influence. Praise God. David said, I want to get among great men. Somebody wrote about if you really are an eagle, why are you hanging around with the turkeys? Sometimes to keep growing means I've got to push some friendships off a little ways and embrace some other new friendships in my life. When my wife and I go to conferences like our general conference, which is our largest in the uh, United States each year, we have so many friends, and that has truly been my greatest blessing from God, is to have so many friends. Because of traveling a lot and doing a lot of things and just being a lot of places, meeting a lot of people, I've got wonderful friends. Of course, we have those that we are closest to than others, and local friends. 
when we go to a conference like a general conference, we, we talk about this before we go. We make an agreement. We are not going to hang out with our closest friends at conference. We're going to be with the friends we don't see often, and we are going to endeavor to meet and make new friends. We don't need any new friends in the sense that we have a lot of friends already. But I know myself. I know myself. And if I don't force myself to keep growing, you see, leaders cannot remain where they are. You are constantly in movement. You are either advancing or you are retreating. There's no such thing as camping out in spiritual leadership. Amen. And so I've got to push myself beyond the boundaries of my comfort zone. And make new friendships. And recognize there are other friendships. If they are not growing and I cannot help them to grow, then maybe I've got to hold them at arm's length because I don't want them to pull me down. I want to get among the great men and women of God who would challenge me and inspire me and motivate me. Praise God. Teddy Roosevelt said, The best leader is the one who has sense enough to pick good men to do what he wants done and self-restraint enough to keep from muddling with them while they do it. Leaders, grow people. Grow people. Praise God. Now here's how you grow people. Number one, believe in them. Believe in them. Probably the comment that I hear most from people that God has placed me as a shepherd in their life, the compliment rather that I hear most is, Pastor, you believed in me. And I genuinely do. I really do believe in people. I've seen so many times how God can recover people that I thought was, they, they were beyond hope. And I've seen God absolutely turn that around. I've seen that so many times. And now I, it's not that I'm really believing in them, but I'm believing in the God, praise God, who's working in them. Hallelujah. Praise God. And so I look at them and say, I believe in you. Believe in you. Believe in you. You've got to believe in people. If you don't believe in the people you lead, you're not going to have people to lead. But if you do believe in them, you'll be amazed at what God will do with their lives. Praise God. Number two, invest in them. Invest in them. You've got to share part of yourself, part of what and where God has brought you. You've got to, you've got to share. It. You've got to bring them along. Bring them on the journey. We we love bringing people from the local church to the Philippines to to work and help and, and uh, do evangelism. I think we're bringing something like fifteen maybe this next week to do some evangelism. And I love to do that, not just so that we have people here to help us, but I know what it's going to do for them. Praise God. It's an investment in them that's going to pay off. They're going to be different people when they get home. Doing more for God. Invest in them. Number three, equip them. Equip them. This is the primary ministry function of the apostolic pastor is equipping you. People. What we commonly call the fivefold ministry, most other translations calls it equipping, equipping pastors, evangelists, teachers, apostles, prophets, pastors, and teachers, and and he calls it for the perfecting. But most translations use the word equipping, and so we are to equip them by training, by teaching. That's what this Tukon is doing. It is equipping. Praise God. Leadership number four to empower them when they are equipped. They must be given an opportunity to try what, what they've been equipped and trained to do. Empower them. Don't be afraid to give people space to fail. You never teach a baby to walk by never letting them fall. We have a fish pond in our house. A koi pond. And I have a little... Nephew, it's just a barely walking. And my sister, every time they come to our house, gets so afraid when he gets around the koi pond. And I said, don't catch him. Let him fall in. He said, let him fall in. He'll drown. No, we'll tie a rope on him and then let him fall in. We'll pull him out. 
But how else is he going to learn? Until you do that, he thinks he can walk on the water. He has to learn. <laughs> Let him walk in. Sometimes we need to give people space to fail. In a controlled environment, we're not going to let them drown or die, but, but let them fail. A young baby learns to walk by falling. That's how they learn. <laughs> Amen. And so empower people to do things. Hand them the ball. Let them run with it. You know they're going to fumble it, but that's okay. Let them have the experience. And then finally, number five, encourage them. Encourage them. And what you'll discover is that the day will come, they're doing a better job than you, you were doing in that area. <laughs> yeah. We've got some young teenagers coming up in the church now. I say, hey, can, can you do something to make my slides look better? <laughs> there was a day when I was the only one that knew how to do it. And now we've got teenagers that know how to do better. Parents, let your kids teach you how to operate the computer. <laughs> they can teach you probably. Amen. And so, encourage them. In closing today, four points of good advice for leaders. Number one, never take down a fence until you know why it was put up. A lot of times we're tempted to take down the fence just because we don't understand why it was put up. So we think it serves no purpose. But don't take down the fence until you know why it was put up. Number two, if you get too far ahead of the army, those you are leading, your fellow soldiers may mistake you for the enemy. You top flight, flight leaders have to apply this. If you get too far ahead of those you're leading, they may mistake you for the enemy. Number three, my father always told me this. This comes from him. Be nice to the people. He would say, son, be nice to the people you meet on your way up the ladder. Because they are the same ones you'll meet when you come back down. And you will come back down. <laughs> and number four is mine. If you want to enjoy the rainbow, be prepared to endure the storm. Praise God. Lord Jesus, we thank you for this leadership session today. Leadership, what is it? You've called every one of us, Christ, to be leaders. Leaders in your kingdom. Leaders in this world. You've called the Israel of nation to be a nation of kings and priests. Spiritual leaders and civil leaders. Now you're raising up the apostolic church, Christ, to be the leaders of the world. I pray, God, that everyone in this room will answer that call. We're leaders in the home. We're leaders at work. We're leaders at school. We're leaders in the church. We're leaders in the community. We are God-called, God-ordained leaders according to your divine purpose. And you are developing the potential within us. Our greatest ability, Christ, is our availability. And with this session, we recognize that. And we step forward and say, Lord, here am I. Use me. I don't have much, but what I have, I put into your hands. Use it for your glory. In Jesus' name, we glorify you. Everybody say amen.